was beautiful. Can you please stand for the reading of God's word? Uh, if you're wondering why is it that we do that, we do this as a sign of reverence to God and his word. The text uh, for today comes from the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to be reading from chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. This is the word of the Lord. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the, same, by the one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, I pray that you speak to us today. We are being reminded, Lord, that the only way that our lives could be transformed is by the power of the gospel as we proclaim your word. Uh, please be with us, Holy Spirit. Illuminate our minds. Allow us to understand and believe. And if it's necessary, Lord, allows us to repent. We pray for all of this in the name of Jesus, and we all say, Amen. you may be seated. Good morning, familia. Good morning. So for those of you that uh, don't know who this Latino is, my name is Hannibal Rodriguez, one of the teaching pastors here. And I want to welcome you again, just in case, you, especially if you're visiting the church for the first time, it is such a blessing that you are here with us, and if there's anything we can do, Please let us know, especially if you see people walking around with a green uh, T-shirt. That's the people you got you to gotta tackle, you got to approach, because they're there to serve you. Now, as many of you know, uh, this is the time during the year in which um, we start in our ministry year. Our ministry year usually starts between August and September. That means that many of our ministries are, st are starting to get ready to serve and love the people that God has brought to this church. It has been the tradition of the church for the last, for the last years, um, at the beginning of every ministry year, to talk about two specific topics. Number one, what it means to serve in community, and number two, what it means to grow in community. Today we're going to talk about the first one, what it means to serve in community. And I have four things for you today. I have an exhortation, I have a warning, I have an invitation, and I have a secret. 25 minutes for each. Exhortation. <laughs> I'm lying. 25. Let's go with the first one, exhortation. Um, and I would like us to read this one together. All right? It says, you are called to serve because you were given a gift. Let's read it again. You are called to serve because you were given a gift. So this is Paul writing to this church um, that has all kinds of gifts. Actually, it's a struggling church because they have this tendency to elevate some gifts more than others. But the premise of the text is this, that every Christian has gifts. That if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you have gifts. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. It doesn't matter if you're a new Christian or an older Christian. It doesn't matter if you know your gifts or you don't know your gifts. Everyone, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, everyone has a gift. That's what Paul says from verses 4 to 6. Actually, you can see in these verses that he uses three different words. He uses the word gifts in verse 4. And then he uses the word um, service in verse 5. And then he uses the word working in verse 6, gifts, service, and working. And there's different opinions among scholars about what those three words mean. But for the most part, 
All scholars would agree and say that these three words function as synonyms, or that these three words complement one another. That if we want to understand what gifts are, we have to grab all these three concepts together. So, for example, the word gift, by definition, is something that God gives to the church. That's what's called a gift, right? And it's something that you don't work for, and it's not something that you earn. It's simply something that God gives to all Christians. He gives these Christians these gifts out of his abundant grace. Grace alone. Now, what is interesting about the word gift here is that it's the same word from the original that we use the word charisma. And this is what it means, people. That in a way, all Christians are charismatic. You got to pay attention to that. I'm not saying Pentecostal. That's, that's a different thing. What I'm saying is that because of the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given us, we are all charismatic. We have some sort of charisma that we all, that, that was given by God. Now, this is the thing, that this charisma, this gift, was given to us to serve. In other words, this charisma that God is giving us, these gifts that God is giving us, is not just for us, it's for us to use it to serve other people. So let me put it this way. A gift is something that God gives to his church, so we put God's grace in action. That's a great tweetable sentence. Our gifts is something that God gives us to put God's grace in action. Whenever, whenever we use our gifts, we are extending the grace of God to others through our service. Whenever we use our gifts, we are giving to others what we have received already in Jesus Christ. It's an extension. We give to others what we have received. What is interesting, though, is that the third word is the word working. And that simply means that the gift is not only something that God gives you by grace alone, right? But it's something that he gives you to serve to others. But it's something that you must use. In other words, if you have a gift and you don't use it, that's just a decoration. Gifts are given so we can use them. I'm going to explain it this way, um, and I hope it makes sense. Um, so I'm Colombian, right? For those of you that don't know where Colombia is, that's in South America, just in case. And Colombians are known for two main things, actually three, soccer, we're awesome soccer players, <laughs> right? Coffee, we got the best coffee in the world. Whether you, amen to that brother. <laughs> and three, for another reason. <laughs> we shouldn't talk about it. So being a Colombian, coffee for me is really important. Right, so for me, coffee comes before milk. Coffee comes before water. Comes before Coffee comes before anything, right? So when I feel weak, it's not because I'm not drinking enough water. It's because I'm not drinking enough coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say that because you know that I like coffee, you give me a, a bag of Colombian coffee. Hint. Um, <laughs> just kidding. No, I'm not. And because you know that that's the best coffee in the world, then you give me this bag, and I grab it, and I smell it. <gasps> Actually, that's what I do. I walk around smelling this beautiful, amazing, delicious coffee. And then I put it in a special room in my home, the perfect temperature. And I make sure that this coffee is not next to one of those cheap coffees, <laughs> you know, Starbucks or one of those. <laughs> Just kidding. No, I'm not. <laughs> But I never drink the coffee. I never drink it. If, the, if that's the gift you gave me, you have the right to say, that coffee is just decoration. That coffee was designed for you to drink it. And that's exactly how we ought to see our gifts. 
our gifts are not decorations. They ought to be used. They ought to be used to serve others. They are ought to put into practice. That's what it means to be a Christian. To be a Christian means that you have a gift and that you use that gift for the serve of, to serve others. Now, we have to ask the question, if that is true for all believers, why is it that there are believers that don't use their gifts the way they're supposed to? And I think that there might be at least two reasons. Number one, because there's actually people that think that don't have any gifts. That's a fallacy. That's, that's a lie. That's not biblical. If you are a believer and the Holy Spirit lives in you, you have a gift, at least one. But the second reason why I think many people don't put their gifts into practice, either it could be because you don't like the gifts that God gave you, which that's an issue, or you envy the gifts that you don't have. But look, at, I, I think this is what Paul has in mind in verses 4 and 11. Look at what he says. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. And in verse 11... He distributes them to each one just as he determines. So to, to follow the train of thought here, because it's amazing to me. Um, this is what Paul says. If you are a Christian, it's because the spirit, the spirit of God lives in you. Actually, we didn't read this, but in verse 3 it says that no one can say that Jesus is Lord except through the Spirit. So the only way that we become a Christian is when the Spirit uh, does his work in our hearts. Now, if every Christian has the Spirit in them, then we know that every Christian has the gifts of the Spirit because that's what he does. Now, if the Spirit is God, the way the Bible shows it, and everything that God gives is good, and everything that God gives has a purpose, then every Christian not only have, not only you have a gift, but they are no useless or wasted gifts. If God is the one that gives gifts, and everything he gives is good and has a purpose, there are no wasted or useless gifts. Actually, let me, let me press that a little bit more. If every Christian has a gift, and every gift comes from God, Every gift displays something of the character and nature of God. Every gift. There are no superior and inferior gifts. We have no permission to underestimate any gift. Whatever gift you have is necessary and whatever gift you have is useful. Whatever you have matters, people. Whatever you have matters. It's important that you keep in mind that not one person has all the gifts. Actually, I would say that not one church has all the gifts. That's why we need many, many churches. And that's why we need many, many Christians. Every time we use our gifts... We are putting in display God's power, God's love, God's mercy, God everything. Every time we use God's gifts is grace in action. Grace in action. That's the exhortation. Now the question might be, well, what are the spiritual gifts? And I know that for those of you that have been walking with the Lord for a while, you, you already have an idea of what that is, right? And what Paul does here is from verses 8 to 10, he gives us a semi-complete list of some of the spiritual gifts. I say that it's semi-complete because you, if you want to get the whole picture, or almost the whole, the whole picture, you have to read also 1 Peter chapter 4, and then Romans chapter 12, and Ephesians chapter 4. And there's different assessments that I know that some of you guys have gone through, try to discover what your gifts are. Um, but, but, but I think that the best way for us to understand what the spiritual gifts are, it, we ought to divide these gifts, all of these, into three different categories. I divide them into prophetic gifts, priestly gifts, and kingly gifts. From verses 8 to 10, you could actually see that. 
right? The prophetic gifts are those that represent God to others. That's what a prophet would do. A prophet would represent God to others and articulates truth, what the Bible says. So I will put under this category gifts such as evangelism, for example, and teaching and speaking and knowledge and discerning, discerning spirits or even prophecy. I'll put that, all of that under prophetic gifts. Now, the second category, the priestly gifts, if you remember, a priest is a person that represents others to God and care for, the people, and care for people's needs. So under this category, I will put gifts such as the gift of encouraging or counseling, Helping, healing, pastoring, generosity, mercy, and something like that, right? But then the third category is what I call the kingly gifts, which represents God's vision and provides direction. And I will say that under this category, there's gifts such as leadership, administration, faith, and so on. Now, if you notice, I'm not explaining what those gifts are. And I'm not going to explain them. You know why? Because that's not the purpose of the sermon. I'm not interested right now that you know exactly what your gift is. What I want right now is that you understand that everyone has a gift and that as a church we display, listen up, unity in diversity. That's actually a concept that I also use for multi-ethnicity in which as a church, we display unity. We are one in Jesus Christ. We got the same father, the same brother, and the same Holy Spirit. We're one, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. One, and yet we're different. We have different gifts. We're supposed to have different gifts. God designs us that way, the same way the Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The church is unity in diversity. So this is the exhortation once again. We are called to recognize that we all have gifts. That all of our gifts display something of who God is. That we ought to use them and use them to serve others. That all of our gifts are expressions of God's grace. That all of our gifts are necessary. That there are no superior or inferior gifts. And that not not one of us has a gift that somebody else don't need. Or that we all need one another's gifts. So next week when we talk about community, you're going to see that that's one of the reasons why you cannot be a lonely Christian. You need other people's gifts in your life. You need other Christians to be part of your life. All right, that's the exhortation. Point one, let's go to point two. Let me give you the warning. And I would like us to read this one together. Your gifts are not about you. Let's read it again. Your gifts are not about you. So look at what Paul says in verses 4 through 6. He uses three words that I highlighted there. Spirit, Lord, and God. That's the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And what the text says actually is this. That is God the one that gives the gifts. That he's God the one that uses those gifts, and that he's God working through the gifts. God gives the gifts, God uses the gifts, and it is God working through the gifts. So whenever you use your gifts, right, God takes the glory, not you, not me. When we use our gifts, God looks good. Not me. When we use our gifts, God looks beautiful. Not us. When we use our gifts, we are not the center of attention. God is. That's so hard to apply. You know how I know that? Because that's me. Every week. I have to remind myself that the gifts I have are not for me. My gifts are for his glory. Listen, I spend about 20 hours a week prepping for a sermon. And you would say, 20 hours for that? (laughs) Yeah, I'm slow like that. I know how to put a sermon together. I know what comes first, what goes second. 
I, I read the books, I, I read other sermons, I listen to other sermons, I think, I meditate, I write, I rewrite, I edit, I do everything that I'm supposed to do. I know how to do this. It's a gift. On the other hand, I know when I'm doing this for my glory and not his glory. You know how I know? When I don't pray enough. When I don't pray like crazy before I preach a sermon. Because I come up here thinking that this thing is about me. So the worst thing that could happen, the worst thing that could happen is that at the end of a service, you say something like, Hannibal, that was awesome. Because the best thing that could happen is that you see how beautiful and amazing and perfect God is. That's when you start using your gifts the way you're supposed to. I think that this is part of the reason why many of us complain. Complain because of the gifts we have and the gifts we don't have. Because we forget that our gifts are not about us. I think this is part of the reason why we envy the gifts that other people have. And we don't like it when people have the platform that we don't have. Because we forget about this. I think this is part of the reason why we, sometimes we don't use our gifts. Because we forget that it's about God. I think that this is part of the reason why we never find contentment. Because we forget this. Our gifts are not about us. Our gifts are about him. This summer I read, uh, I read this great book called The Way of the Dragon and the Way of the Lamb. It's a, it's a book that I fully recommend. And the authors, a couple of pastors there, but the authors argue that one of the struggles in the church is that we use spiritual gifts as devices for our self-fulfillment. Meaning that we use them to, to find some sort of self-fulfillment. And I quote, we mistakenly believe that these gifts are special abilities almost like superpowers. In other words, we use whatever the Lord has given us, but, but, but to elevate ourselves. The consequence, though, they argue, of using our gifts like that is actually two. Number one, you start trusting yourself way too much. Self-reliance. And when you start to think, man, I could do this. I got this. And the second thing, the second consequence is that you could get to a point in which you don't think you need God. I told you, this is what the Lord works with me every week. And this is what the Spirit reminds me, that if I don't pray, then I get to the point where I think that I could do this without God. You know how dangerous that is? This is not about us. It's about him. That's why we have to use them with the right motivation for the right purpose. Actually, this was so uh, convicting to me because I realized that even as, I, as I'm exercising the gift, I need God in the midst of that at that moment. You know where I get that from? Philippians chapter 2. Listen up. For it is God who works in you to will and to act. In order to fulfill his good purpose. Fully dependent on God at all times. To will and to act. I cannot even fulfill God's call for my life if I don't depend on him. Your gifts are not about you. Your gifts are about him. That's the warning. Here's another warning though. That your gifts are not about you. Verse 7 says that your gifts are for the common good. You notice that? Your gifts are to be used for the common good. That's why one of the uh, words that we use for gifts is serving. Your gifts are not for self-gratification necessarily. Your gifts is for the benefit of the community. Your gifts are so you learn how to put others ahead of yourself. Your gifts is for the, are for the community, not for the individual. Your gifts are not for self-fulfillment. I, I would actually argue that the only way a Christian finds fulfillment 
is when you use your gifts for the common good. Is when you use your gifts for the glory of God and the common good. As a society, that doesn't make any sense because we are part of a society that has a, a consumer mentality. People think that if we have a lot, if we receive a lot, we, if we accumulate a lot, then we're going to find fulfillment. But what the Bible makes it clear is that fulfillment comes only when you're willing to use what you have for the sake of others. You know where I get that from? Jesus. For the joy set before me, I endured the cross. Real fulfillment only comes when you use your spiritual gift for the sake of others and the glory of God. I think that this is a good point for us to make a distinction between a talent and a spiritual gift, because I think people get confused. A talent is something you have, you were born with that. Or maybe you developed it as time went by. The problem with talents is that you could, you could be a, a super successful and you could be super efficient in whatever you do because you got that talent. But that doesn't mean that you're a good person because of that. Because you can use that talent for selfish reasons. So here's the question. How can a person use their talents with the right purpose, with the right motive? And the answer is that when you use your talents and you align them with your spiritual gift. The only way a person can use a talent for the right purpose, with the right motive, is when you use it for the glory of God and the common good. Not for personal gratifications, but to serve others. I actually think, in my time as a pastor, I've, I've met all kinds of people, right? But I, I came to the conclusion that it's the people that use their talents and they align them to spiritual gifts like this. These are the people that never need to be recognized. You know, that they just serve. They don't, they don't need a platform. Sometimes they don't even need to be appreciated. They, they just do. This is the kind of people that they serve not to be fulfilled, but because they have been fulfilled already. Actually, this is the kind of people that find fulfillment in using their gifts for the sake of others. This is the kind of people that are willing to suffer for others. Because they're, they're not serving to get something in exchange. They're serving for the sake of others. They would do anything for others. The way I can explain this is almost like a, like a Christian Navy SEAL. Not just a Navy SEAL, a Christian Navy SEAL. So if you know anything about that, this is a group of, the, the, it's amazing when I think about this group of people. It's usually it's a small group of people from 5 to 10, right? From what I read. And these are the group that always go before anybody else. And this is the group that nobody knows who they are. They just go in, do their job, and then get out. And it is because they do their job well that then everybody else comes and they win the war. Right? They go in, do their thing, and disappear. No one knows who they are until later on. They don't come back, they don't come back and say, look at me, look at what I did. You won the war because of me. Completely quiet, completely ignored, completely underappreciated. And yet they enjoy doing what they do. Because they're not looking for fulfillment in the very thing. They're looking for fulfillment in doing what God asked them to do. Your gifts are not about you. Your gifts are for the glory of God and the common good. That's exhortation, a couple of warnings, and now that I made you feel guilty, let me give you an invitation. Let's read this one together. Put God's grace in action because you were made for this. I told you before that our gifts are God's grace in action. I think that the best verse here in this text is verse 6. Look at what Paul says. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. You know what that means? That he's God working in you, and he's God working through you. It is God displaying his glory and power and mercy and love and everything he is through you. 
It is God displaying his grace through you. So the invitation is this. Don't hear this sermon just as more information. If you are not serving yet, this is what you ought to do. This is what you need to do. You are called to join a team somehow. So we're going to put it here on the screen, but we, we, we have so many things that we do as a church. So many things that we could do as a church. There's so many different opportunities, so many different ways in which you can use your gifts. So many different ways in which you can actually invest in the people, in the lives of others. So, so maybe for some of you, it's involve yourself, involved with, in, in kids' life. You know, serving with our younger generation, you, you have no idea the power and influence that one person has over one kid. One person over one kid. Put God's grace in action in the lives of the younger generation. Maybe for some of us, it's lead a group, lead a life group, or live, be part of the, one of the small groups, right? Maybe for some of us, it's uh, be, being part of the production team. You know that every Sunday, it's crazy to me. When I was praying in pastoral prayer, when I said that I'm so thankful that I feel honored to be part of this, it's because I come really early on Sunday, and there's hundreds of people serving in this place every weekend. So my invitation to you is to join a team. If you don't know how to do that, just follow the website, wittenbible.org slash get involved. Or at the end of the service, go to the atrium. There are a bunch of tables there. Um, you could approach one of them and ask for information. Remember, if you're here, if you are a Christian, you have a gift. It doesn't matter what it is. You got to use it. Now, it's so interesting because when I talk to people, some of the complaint is, well, I don't know what my gift is, right? That would be one. And then the other argument is, I don't find a place in which I can use my gift. As a personal story, I got to tell you that I did not know what my gifts were until I started doing things. You could take the test. You could do the assessment. You could do all of that stuff. You know what I realized with that? Number one is that we are so sinful that we can actually answer what we want the assessment to tell us. <laughs> so when a person tells me, Hannibal, there's nothing for me here. I'm a leader. And I always ask the question, who's following you? Because if you have the gift of being a leader and you turn around and there's no one back there, you are not a leader. <laughs> someone could say well I got the gift of teaching in this church there's no place to teach and I say how do you know that you have that gift uh, have you ever taught uh, if you have never taught you don't know if you have the gift passing information doesn't mean that you're a teacher see this is what I discovered for me in my life. I discovered my, what my gifts were when I started doing things. They need help over here, I do over here. They need help over there, I do over there. I'm a Latino pastor. In Latino pastors, we do everything in church. We clean, we get the communion ready, we preach, we pastor, we shepherd, we visit. And during that process, I realized what things I was good at and what things, oh, maybe somebody else should do it. You discover only by doing. This is the attitude of a Christian is not to find the places where your gifts can be used. Let God deal with that. As a Christian, the attitude is to serve. I respect more a person that say that goes into Sunday school class and he's teaching and he's an awful teacher than a person that is sitting down knowing that there's no teachers doing nothing. Use your gifts. Discover your gifts. Maybe the Lord is going to show you other gifts that you didn't think you have. Exhortation, warning, invitation, and lastly, this is the secret. Can you read this one with me, please? You can only give what you have received. Let's do it again. You can only give what you have received. 
Look at what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 8, 2. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Look at what Paul says here. Paul says that the only reason why a person becomes a Christian is because of the grace of God. That's it. That we become a Christian is not because we work for it or we earned it. We become Christians by grace alone, through faith alone. That's it. It was because of the grace of, it, it is because by grace alone that Jesus came to serve you first. It is by grace alone that Jesus came not to seek self-fulfillment, but to seek you. It is by grace alone that Jesus goes to the cross. Not as a consumer, but as a giver. As a giver of life, as a giver of forgiveness, as a giver of peace, as a giver of joy, as a giver of God. The most beautiful thing about Christianity is that we get God. It is by grace alone that we, in Jesus, become God's handiwork. Masterpiece. It is the Christian that is... um, It is God in display. It is the Christian doing what we're supposed to do that we put God in display in everything we do. It's all by grace alone. But Paul says that it's not only by grace alone, just to save us, right? But if that's the case, by grace alone, we have nothing to brag about. Everything we are and everything we have is because he gave it to us. God is at the center, not us. Grace alone, nothing to brag about. And if we we have been saved by grace alone, and there's nothing to brag about, salvation doesn't stop just there. Because Paul says that if God saved us in Jesus, was so we could do good works. Can you see it? Our good works flow from our salvation. We do good works because we have been saved. We do good works because God is good. We do good works because he is worthy. We do good works because we want people to see him and find him beautiful. We do good works because he's a God of mercy. We do good works because he's worthy of our adoration. We do good works because he served us first. The only reason why we serve other people is because he served us first. You're called to serve because you have a gift. But you got to remember that that gift is not about you. That gift is about putting God's grace in action. You were saved for that. And you can only give to others what you already have. Amen? Can you please stand? Let's read. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful that you saved us. We are so thankful that everything we are and everything we have is because of your grace. Lord, at the same time, it's so easy to make the mistake and thinking that we don't have gifts or that our gifts define us. Lord, it is only through the power of the gospel that we understand that we all have gifts to be used for your glory and the common good. But it's also because of the power of the gospel that we know that our gifts don't define us. What defines us is that we have been purchased, adopted, and loved and forgiven forgiven in Jesus Christ. That's an identity. Lord, but out of that identity, I pray that you make of us people that use those gifts for your glory and the common good. So we get to put your grace in action. So people find you simply amazing. Please make that happen. And now, Lord, we want to receive the blessing that Jesus Christ guarantees for us at the cross. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And the church says, have a blessed day. If you need prayer, please come to the front. Next week, we're going to talk about what it means to live in community. We love you. You are sent.